Before I begin, I need to make just a couple of brief announcements. Um, Next Sunday, we're going to have a special offering taken for family uh, within our church community. Uh, So we ask that you uh, prepare yourself to do that. Um, Thank you. Just prepare to bring a special offering, a love offering next Sunday. We'll have baskets set up in the back of the church. And uh, another announcement is that on the 16th, we're going to have a special called business meeting, which will be conducted immediately after Bible study. On the 16th is a Wednesday night, two Wednesday nights from now, and we'll be, um, the uh, Youth Pastor Search Committee will be presenting to the church uh, Mr. Dylan Blanton, uh, for the position of youth pastor. So we ask that if you come that night, if you have questions. Uh, Mr. Dillon is here with us today. Uh, Just by chance, happens to be here. So if you want to meet him, how about stand up, Dillon, so everybody can kind of see you. So if you want to talk with him afterwards, you know, have a, thank you. Uh, Have a chat with him. And uh, you can look, if you never met him before, he did speak at our youth service. And uh, that's on the internet, if you'd like to look at that or If not, uh, the fellows in the back will make you a copy of that DVD if you would like to hear him preach. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to ask you to stand as we read uh, verses 26 through 38. As we saw the opening of this video from the movie The Nativity, we see this encounter that Mary had with the angel Gabriel. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And the angel left her. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we hear from you this morning, I pray that our hearts will also say with Mary, may it be to me as you have said. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alexander the Great was one of the world's greatest generals that was ever known, and uh, he conquered most of the known world at the time of his reign. One night, while his army was in uh, encampment around a place that they were fighting, he couldn't sleep, and he got up and he walked around the tents of the encampment that they were in. And as he was walking, he came upon a young soldier who had fallen asleep during guard duty. Now, a soldier at this time falling asleep during guard duty, it was, it was for the most part an instant death that were to come to him. Even his commanders, if they were to catch him sleeping during guard duty, they would sometimes pour kerosene over their bodies and light them for their punishment. Alexander came to the young man and said, Do you know the penalty for falling asleep? And the young man said, Yes, sir. The soldier, he asked, What is your name? And the young man said, Alexander, sir. And Alexander the Great again said, I asked you, soldier, what is your name? He said, my name is Alexander, sir. Alexander the Great asked him once more, I asked you, what is your name, soldier? 
And he humbly said, my name, sir, is Alexander. Alexander the Great looked at the young man and he said, you either do one of two things. You change your name or you change your conduct. Names are important. Names are important. You know, uh, we uh, oftentimes name the ones that we are babies after, after ones that we love, whether it's a, a parent, a grandparent, uh, an uncle, an aunt, or a favorite person. But a lot of times we'll name our children after people that we care about. I was, I was looking up this week the, uh, the five most popular boy and girl names this year. And, and, uh, and, and for the boys, it was Liam, Noah, Mason, Ethan, and Logan. So if you didn't name your kids that, you're not as popular as uh, the rest of the world. The, uh, the girls' names were Emma, Olivia. Olivia. Where's she at? Sophia, Ava, and Isabella. None of them were Mary. No, no Mary's in the group, but Mary is a beautiful name, amen? Amen. <laughs> That's Mary with a Y here in mine. Miss I. <laughs> Mary is Latin in its origin. It means star of the sea. The Hebrew word for Mary is Miriam. And we first hear Miriam. We hear Mary's name as Miriam as Moses' sister. And, and, the, and the meaning of that is mother of Christ. Beautiful name. Beautiful name. The title of this message, in case you didn't see, is, is what is in a name. And this morning I, I, I pray that we will see how precious this name Mary is and the, and, the, and the precious woman that this young girl was, this Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus. And what a beautiful song and how appropriate, you know, Bob, that you sang this morning for this message. In verse 26, it says, In the sixth month God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Now, now, six months earlier, six months earlier, the angel Gabriel, the same angel, had visited a man named Zechariah who told him also that your wife, Elizabeth, will have a child. Now, we remember the story from last week that as he, as he told this, this in the holy place, in the temple, that, that uh, Zechariah had doubts about it, and so the angel Gabriel struck him dumb. He could not speak. Now, this, this angel, Gabriel, is a messenger from God. That's what angel means anyway. Angel means messenger. So we see that this one is from God. This messenger had something important to tell Mary. And a couple of interesting things here that we need to consider as we look at this is God sent this angel, and he sent this angel, Gabriel. So the information that the angel had to share with Mary was not the information from Gabriel. It was not some idea that Gabriel had himself. It was information that was from God Almighty and no one else. You know, I wonder sometimes, are there messengers that are sent to you and I? Are you listening to me? You know, are there messengers that come to us that we ignore? You know, I, I wonder if there are times that God's speaking to us through somebody else. You know, sometimes people have something to tell us, but we don't really want to hear what they have to say because it may not be the person that we feel like is qualified to share the information with us. And most of the times, the information that they share may not necessarily be what it is that we want to hear. So what we do, we ignore them. We ignore them. And another thing that we do sometimes is we ignore information that's shared with us because we may be afraid. I'll get into that in a minute. I just wonder sometimes if God is not prepared to give us instruction and we're just simply not interested in hearing it. You, you know you've heard the story. I know you've heard it, but the guy, he, and he's, there's, there's a big flood that comes to his house. You know the story. Flood comes to his house, and, and, the, and the policeman comes by in his car, and he says, you know, I want to evacuate you. I want you to take you out of here so you don't get flooded and you don't drown. He says, don't worry about me. God's going God's to rescue me. So a little later on, a guy comes up in a boat. He's standing up. You know, he's in, he's in the house. He said, he said, look, you got to get in the boat. The flood's here. You know, I want to get you out of here. I want to get you safe. And, and, the, and the man tells him, don't worry about me. God's going to rescue me. And, and later, the man's standing on the roof of his house. The flood waters have gone so high, a helicopter comes down and says, look, get in the helicopter while you still can. And the man says, don't worry about me. God's going to rescue me. Well, the man drowns. And he stands before the Almighty and he asks, God, why didn't you rescue me? And God says, he said, well, I sent a man in a car, I sent a man in a boat, and I sent a man in a helicopter. What else did you want me to do? 
You know, sometimes God is directing and giving us information, but we just simply don't want to hear it because we got our minds so fixated on what it is that God is instructing us to do. Now, Gabriel, he comes to this teenage girl in this little old village of Nazareth. This is an insignificant place. This is a crossroads where the soldiers of Rome normally traveled through. It was even said by Nathaniel that what good is there that comes from Nazareth, speaking of when they met Jesus. It had a bad reputation. Nazareth is about 75 to 100 miles north of Israel, or Jerusalem rather, and it's just a small community, probably something like we have here at Albertson. Probably about the same thing. And can you imagine, can you imagine what our community be, would be like if we had some, something like this that occurred here in Albertson that occurred there in Nazareth? Why would God even choose such a depressed place to bring about his son? Why, why would he do that? Why, why not Jerusalem? Why not the center place of where worship was to take place? Don't you think that, I mean, really, I mean, if you had an opportunity to give God some advice about how to bring this about, would you not say, Nazareth, no, Lord, I like your idea, but that's really not going to work. You get him in Jeru Jerusalem, you get him there, and, and, and be in the center of all this happening, you're going to be a whole lot more effective there, God. Right? How many of you have ever given God instruction? Uh, one honest person in here. Thank you. All right, a couple. Well, thank God for that. God has a different idea of how things... Luke chapter 6, verse 20, 23, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you... Well, let's place the word happy. Happy. Happy are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Happy are you who weep now, for you shall what? laugh blessed are you when people hate you and when you're excluded and are and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the son of man rejoice in that day and leap for joy for behold your reward is great in heaven for so their fathers did to the prophets see jesus is for all people he's not just for the elite he's not just for the ones that the world considers to be important. He is for all mankind. He is for the mighty. He's for the poor. He's for the depressed. He's for the blessed. He's for everybody. Praise God. Praise God. Verse 27, it said, To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, these arrangements are a lot different than they are today. There's no doubt about it. These, this, this pledging or the, the betrothal is much different than an engagement that a man and woman would have today. Now, this pledging or betrothal, uh, a young woman was, was taken aside and, and, and her husband was picked for her, okay? Her husband was picked for her and told who it would be that she would be married to. I'm not going to get into a lot of details about that because there's certainly some other attributes into that. And I, and I believe that, 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 that if it were my daughter, you know, I'm not going to pick somebody necessarily that I know my daughter hates. So I want to pick somebody that I feel like that she at least likes or, or feels like that she can learn to love. You know, but this is what took place. And, and so Mary, she was chosen for this man. And this engagement was, was very strict. It, it was an opportunity. It was an opportunity for the woman, for the young lady to show her faithfulness to her new husband. It was also an opportunity and a time. This lasted for one year. It was an opportunity and a time for the husband to be to prepare a place for them to live. Now, I think that's significant. You listen to me, moms and dads. It's an opportunity for the man to get a job, to earn some money, to get a place to live, buy a house, build a house, whatever it may be, not for an opportunity for them to just get married and just stay and move in with mom and dad. It's an opportunity for them to show themselves, most especially the man, to get things ready for this new woman that's coming into my household. These, these young girls were between the ages of 12 and 16 years old for the most part. Some say a little older. How many 12-year-olds we got in the room here this morning? Anybody? Anybody 12, 13? They're all at the play. Yeah, okay. But can you imagine? 
Can you imagine moms and dads that use that, have them at that age, that you would be ready to present them to someone as a husband? And so certainly you can see why that this year is important, that this man get himself together to prepare for this young girl that's to come into his house. Parents made these arrangements. Luke makes note that Joseph was from the lineage of David. Even though Joseph was, was the uh, adoptive father of Jesus, he wasn't the biological father of Jesus, but we see that he comes from the lineage of, of David himself, just as prophecy had foretold that he would be a descendant of him. Verse 28 and 30, it says, The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be, but the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. Now, the Catholic Church has distorted this passage of Scripture to the extent that they have set Mary upon a place to be worshipped. And, and many will say that they don't worship Mary, but their actions show that in most cases that they do. Saying that she is a, a fountain to dispense grace. She's been elevated to a position as one that can conjure favor to those who seek God. I, I just want to just give you a little history lesson in this for just a second. You ever wonder how this came about, why the Catholic Church began to pray to Mary? You ever, you ever just wonder that? And, and, I, and the reason I'm going to tell you this is because when you always wonder why Steve is always saying that you need to go to Bible study, you need to read your Bible, you need to pray, you need to know what this word says. Because in the Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages, from, from 500 uh, A.D. on for quite some time, the, 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 the people that went to church were ignorant of what the Word said. The Bible was written in Latin. No one could read it except for the monks and the priests. You didn't have a copy of the Scripture. Only thing that you knew is what it was that they told you at the time. Now, what began to happen is the people did not see Jesus as the loving intercessor that we know Him to be because of what Scripture says. So they saw Jesus as someone that was distant, and they began to pray to Jesus' mother. To Jesus' mother to intercede for them to Christ so that Christ himself would intercede to the Father. This is how this began to take place. Now I want you to think of this yourself, because we have a tendency to do this also. How many times do you come to me or come to some pastor and say, Preacher, I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray for so-and-so. I want you to... And, 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 and if, I'm, if I'm worth my salt... One of the first things I'll say, I will do that, but you can speak to God yourself. Okay? It's, it's, not, it's not that I have any special power or any special ability to intercede for you on behalf of God. You can speak to God yourself. And what, what goes on, it goes on so oftentimes, is that we begin to, to put the messenger on the pedestal and, and, and we, don't, we don't place the one that the message is going to. It happens in churches so often. It doesn't happen here. Because you guys keep me in my place, don't you, Justin? But so oftentimes, the people began to worship the pastor and not the one that the pastor is speaking of. Don't ever let that happen. It happened, it happened to the apostles also. If you read in Revelation 19, you'll see because of what the angel told John that he fell down and began to worship him. And the angel said, get on your feet. I am just a servant of God myself. Mary was troubled. And I realize the angel has not told Mary anything about giving birth to Jesus yet. He just showed up. And he said, he just greeted her. Greetings to you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, I suspect that Mary is a lot like us that we would be today. And, you know, we know that we're sinners. We know that we're unworthy of any kind of praise. We know that we would not choose ourselves as to be the one that God would favor, right? And the task of being the parent of the long-awaited Messiah, Mary was certainly perplexed in, uh, in what he had to say. And like you and I would have been, we'd have, been, we'd have felt unworthy of this greeting from this messenger. Mary was afraid, just like you and I are oftentimes afraid. But we're going to see... Mary's reaction to fear in just a minute. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about your reaction to fear. I want you to think about Mary's reaction to fear. It's not the reaction that a lot of us have today. Fear keeps us from doing anything. You hear me? 
Fear just stops us. Fear keeps us from trusting in God. It keeps us from relying on God to accomplish what it is that he desires in our lives. Fear oftentimes causes us to flee, to run away. In order for the Lord to work through our lives, we must have a life that is fearful and humble. For God to work through our lives, we must be fearful and humble. We've got to realize that God is not only a God to be feared, but he's also a loving father. He is our Savior, He is our Shepherd, and He is the righteous judge of all the world, and all of this together. You see, God was to Mary not, not only those things. He was a God of love. And, and so Mary's fear did not cause her to flee. She returned to Him. Our, our fear of God should not drive us away from God, but it should draw us near to Him. Thank you, Adam. Mary, she was a young, poor female in this little backwater village of Nazareth in Galilee. And how, how could God Almighty use someone as a, insignificant as myself to accomplish what it is that this angel is telling Mary? Well, God chose the young girl Mary for one of the most important acts that he had asked of any human being throughout all of history. And you may feel that your ability or your education would make you an unlikely candidate for God's service in this kind of area. You may feel that there are others that are much more qualified and better suited to do the work than what he's called you to do, right? You, you may believe that you're not worthy for the service of the Lord. But I'm going to tell you this, friend. You need to stop placing limitations on God. <laughs> You, 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 don't, don't believe that God cannot use certain people because you believe that you're not qualified. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth because the people were placing other people in some special status and they decided that they wanted to follow them or listen to this one because of their ability. And Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 2, 3, and 5. It says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but, were, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom, but on what? And He can use you, friends, if you only have faith. And you've heard this many times, God does not choose the qualified, right? qualifies those that he chooses. Don't forget that. Verse 31 and 33, it says, You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of, the, of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. I find it real interesting here. He didn't ask Mary if she'd be willing to do the task. Do you hear what I'm saying? He didn't come to her and say, Mary, i got a proposition for you. I think it'll work out for you. I think you're going to enjoy it. I think it might be a little difficult for you, but I think you got the gusto to handle it. He didn't ask her nothing. When God speaks to us, he's not asking you anything, okay? He's telling you. He's instructing you. Now, you can respond to it in a number of different ways. He didn't give her any options as whether or not she'd give birth to Jesus. She, he announced that she would be the mother of the Messiah. He gave, he gave her the name that she was to call him, told him who he would be and how she was to handle it. He let her know that he'd be the ruler of the Israelites that they had long awaited, but he didn't ask her if she would accept it. You hear me, church? He didn't ask her. Now, this is interesting to me. Here, here we have a teenage girl that, that, will, that will go through the most humiliating experience of her life. You've got to picture the time. It, it's not so humiliating this day and time. But in this particular time, it would have been the most humiliating thing for a young girl to come to her mom and dad and to the people of that time and say that I'm pregnant. Everyone in the village... Everyone in the village would have hated her, would have shunned her. They believed that she was lying, and her fiancé believed that she was lying. The only thing that Mary asked is, how is this going to happen? It's not, it's not doubt. 
She didn't ask like Zachariah asked. She asked in wonder. She knew she was a virgin. And she was just amazed that this was going to happen. How's it going to happen? How is this going to take place? How do you and I respond to some of these same situations? I can tell you, when asked and not told to perform some task in the church, we want a detailed explanation of how it's going to be done. You think about this, friends, when I'm talking to you. We first say, well, I'm not really qualified to do this. We, we begin to explain that, 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 uh, that there's probably other people that are more gifted in the church to perform this particular task than me, and you begin to even give names of people that you feel like are better qualified than yourself. We say that we're not suited, we're not educated enough, and it's really it's kind of out of my comfort zone. Are you, are, do, you, do you hear yourself in any of these things? And, and, and this is what everybody says. Listen to me. Let me think about it. Or even we want to make it even stronger. Let me pray about it. Now, let me pray about this thing. Let me pray about this thing. Did, did, Mary, did Mary call a, a, a deacon's meeting to ask whether or not she should do this? Did she come before the church and say, I need to talk with the church. I need to get the congregation. I need to get a prayer team together to find out whether or not that I need to do this. No, because she knew who it was that was coming to give her instruction. The angel Gabriel come from God Almighty, and he spoke through him to tell Mary, you are going to have a baby, Mary. He's going to be the one that's been prayed for all of these years, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. Man, I'd love to hear people just say, I'll do it. I'll do it. Thank you, Steve, for coming to me. I'll do it. I can do all things for him who gives me strength. Amen? But we don't. Why? Because we're afraid. We're afraid. Are we given a spirit within us to be fearful? 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. We don't respond because we're afraid of the unknown. We're uncertain of, that we can't accomplish the task. We don't believe that we're capable of handling the job, and we certainly don't believe that we're qualified for the job spiritually. <laughs> Verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is what? Possible with God. And Mary's response, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. This teenage girl had been jolted out of all of her plans. You know she had plans. She had been betrothed to this young man. She was looking forward to raising Joseph's babies, teaching her children just like her mother had taught her, teaching them to cook and to, and to care for the family and do all the things that good mothers of that time did. She was looking for this, this wonderful experience for people to come around her and love her and love her baby, but no, that's not what was going to happen now. She was going to be shunned. She was going to be put out. We see a commitment that I wish that I could see in the churches of today. And I only pray, friends, that you and I here at Albertson will respond as Mary has responded. No arguing, no complaining, not, not saying, well, wonder what the neighbors will say. Just, a, just an abandonment that seeks God's will and forgetting the plans that we've made for ourselves. How many of you make plans for yourselves? When, when was the last time you just, you, just, you just let God have his way in your life? Just let him have it. When, when was the last time that you just, you just praised God in public? You just praise God walking down the street. Praise God. What kind of freak is that? When was the last time you put your reputation on the line? You know, your, your embarrassment, your comfort zone, your money, your life for God. When was the last time you just, you just said, I don't care, God. It's yours. 
Why is that we are so much more worried about what our neighbors think and what God thinks? Mary didn't hang her head down. She didn't wallow in her worries and her circumstances. She didn't act in fear as to what Joseph would think. Mary simply trusted somehow God's going to take care of it. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know he will. Mary asked the question, how will this be? And Gabriel said, for nothing is impossible with God. And so her response, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. You know, I, I, just, I just can't help but consider what this should mean to us today. You know, I, I've, I've thought about this and thought about it this week. And in and, and doing so, I can't help but think, you know, how, how would we have reacted in the same situation? And I'm not saying that God's going to call on you and some angel's going to come to you and say, hey, you know, uh, Robin, you're going to have a baby, you know, and, and, and just start laying all this out in front of you. I'm not saying that, but God does call on us regularly, friends. He does call on us regularly. You may be called, you may be called to be, go into the ministry. You may be called to go on the mission field. You may be called to be a teacher in our church. You may be called to give up your career for the Lord. You, you, you may be called to stand up for your faith when there's other people around you that are criticizing our Lord and His Word. This is a daily thing now. You may be called to pray for somebody in school. Our lives are interrupted nearly every day. If you think about that, because you may think, well, mine never is. I'm going to tell you this, friends, if your lives is not interrupted because you're not paying attention. If you're paying attention to Him, your lives will be interrupted from the normal routine of your day. You and I come here to church every Sunday. We believe what this book says. There ain't no doubt about it. We, we know that it's true, and we claim to be obedient to its teachings. But I wonder how often we ignore the calling of God has in our lives. I wonder if we're just hearers of the words and not doers. James chapter 1, it says, Do not merely listen to the word and, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. <laughs> but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, <coughs> not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. The word came to Mary, friends. She embraced it. She acted on it. She sang a song to glorify it. You'll read a little later. Isaiah received the word to go preach, and he said, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and, and, and who will go for us? And I said, What? Here I am. Send to me. Basically, bas Mary basically said, whatever God wants me to do, I'll do it. I, I know it's going to cause me embarrassment. That's okay. I, I know that it's going to cause me some heartache. I can deal with that. I, I know it's going to cause me to lose my family. So be it. I know that I'm going to be persecuted. I know I'm going to suffer. I don't care. I don't care. Thy will be done, Lord, not mine. Can you imagine, church, what could be accomplished in our community, community here in Albertson if we just responded as Mary responded to the angel's calling? Mary heard the voice of the Lord, and she was ready and prepared to listen to the calling of God. So often you and I never hear God's calling. Because we are so distracted by so many other things in this life. There's so many other things that are keeping us from listening to what it is that God's calling us. We got too much going on. We got too much TV. We got too much ball games. We got too much activity. We got too many things going on in our lives that we get distracted and we never hear from God and we wonder why we don't hear from God. And the reason is, is you don't put the time on your knees to hear from God. You don't put time in that book to hear from God. You don't take the time to meditate on what it is that the book says to hear from God. You do those three things, you will hear from God. You will get instructed from God. He will lead you in some places and opportunities will be placed before you that you have never seen before. A lot of times people don't hear from him because they don't know his voice. John 10, 27 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them 
and they follow me. That's how we hear his voice, friends. That's how we recognize his voice. Isaiah 66, 2 says, This is the one I esteem. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Amen. Do you tremble in his word? Do you humble yourself when you begin to sit down and read the scripture? This is God speaking to you. That is amazing when you think about this book, that God is actually speaking to us when we open it and begin to read. We're not reading about someone. He is, he is speaking to me. There's a lot of things to consider, friends, most especially this Christmas. There, there's so many things to ponder upon. But today I'm just going to ask you to respond. That's it. I just, I'm just asking you to respond. Don't just hear these words this morning, but I want you to respond to them. I want you to respond in the way that Mary did. I am the Lord's servant. Say it with me. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Let's pray. I pray, O oh God, on behalf of these servants here, that we respond to you today. That we hear your voice. That we, we know you. And that we act upon the instruction that you give in our life. Not that we'll debate it or argue it. But we will just say, Father, let it be unto me as you have said. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bob, come.